Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you for the panelists and faculty, as well as all the attendees for taking time out on this uh, Wednesday evening. Um, I want to um, uh, introduce everyone. First of all, we're gonna have um, three people looking at the chat box, making sure that they're gonna, uh, that uh, we're interacting with the attendees. Please uh, interact with the group through the chat box. Um, go to the bottom of your screen and click the chat, chat button. It'll open up a dialogue box and you can type in like a regular chat feature. Uh, so with that, um, please let me introduce uh, some key people. Uh, first and foremost will be Dr. Erwin Goldstein. He is a world expert in uh, sexual medicine and he's a, a, a practicing urologist. Um, and he takes care of patients with pelvic dysesthesias and we'll talk about that. And one of the topics that we keep coming across in the course of taking care of patients is that many of our patients have some type of urinary dysfunction. Many of them have been diagnosed with interstitial cystitis, which uh, is a diagnosis that I've even heard of because it's so common. Um, and I've been told that it's a very difficult problem to treat sometimes. So uh, we're going to try to address why that might be. In other words, is there a non-bladder cause of urinary dysfunction? Um, things like the, the spine, all the other organs, the vagina, um, et cetera. We'll talk about that. We'll also have Dr. Barry Kumizarak, who's a professor uh, and neuroscientist at Rutgers University. He's part of our team that uh, looks at this from a very scientific neurological perspective. And he'll give us his uh, viewpoints on how neurological problems can cause pelvic dysesthesias and specifically urinary dysfunction. And then finally, we have April Patterson, who is um, a, a physical therapist from Los Angeles that uh, specializes in uh, pelvic floor physical therapy, knows a lot about this topic, is also a patient with GPD. So she'll both talk about uh, important non-operative treatments for this problem, as well as her experience so we can get like a patient perspective. And then on top of that, we'll have uh, the person that kind of makes all this happen, Sue Goldstein, who um, in her own right uh, is a faculty member, but she keeps the group together. She coordinates everything. She'll be the um, kind of moderator and master of the chat box together with Jennifer Blevins, my PA, um, and Lana, who is kind of coordinating everything in the background, just because there's a lot of technical issues that goes on with these virtual meetings. Uh, I'm Chol Kim, and um, I'll address the issues related to spine problems that may be contributing to pelvic dysesthesias, and in particular, urinary dysfunction and what can be done about it. So with that, uh, once again, I want to remind everybody to use the chat feature. I can even call up some people to ask questions live if you're so inclined. Just let us know on the chat, chat feature. or We may even ask you. Um, but let's get started with Dr. Goldstein. Um, he's going to give us a, a brief presentation and present the clinical problem. And then he's going to pose some uh, initial questions to each member of the group and we'll try to answer them. And then after that, we'll start answering whatever questions pop up in the chat. Uh, that uh, the attendees are interested in. So with that, let me give the controls over to Dr. Goldstein. Hi, Dr. Kim. Thank you so much for this amazing honor. Um, uh, you are totally amazing uh, at putting this all together. Your, your Spine Institute of San Diego, SIOSD, is amazing. You have amazing people, and it's an honor to, to be associated with you. Um, the topic today is uh, uh, why some people with interstitial cystitis uh, aren't getting better with traditional interstitial cystitis treatments, and I want to address that. Um, 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 I'm a urologist, and bladder issues are, are uh, very common in my world, uh, as it is in uh, other urologic worlds. It's one of our central organs. But as a sexual medicine doctor, uh, I also see... Uh, maybe uh, along with bladder issues, uh, genital issues, and uh, along with genital issues, the nerves that relate to the uh, genital tissues, and then my affiliation association now uh, five years plus with uh, Dr. Cholkim, the association of the spine with the bladder and the genitals is becoming really quite fascinating and quite revealing. So uh, the term interstitial cystitis is... Uh, uh, was uh, um, um, uh, a compilation of bladder symptoms. As you can see here, there's a version of interstitial cystitis 
that's called ulcerative interstitial cystitis. And there is this erosion that you see inside the bladder when you do what's called cystoscopy and you look inside the bladder. Uh, and this uh, is called a Hunter's ulcer uh, after the name of the doctor that described it. And the people who have this version of ulcerative interstitial cystitis um, have the classic urgency and frequency and pain symptoms. Uh, but the documentation on cystoscopy of the ulcer is the formal diagnosis of uh, ulcerative interstitial cystitis. But the fact of the matter is, if you look at the, the, the basket of individuals with IC, those who have the Hunter's ulcers represent really a small portion, uh, maybe five, maybe 10% of the group. Now, the more common version of this condition of pain, urgency, and frequency would be the non-ulcerative type. So when you look in with a cystoscope, you do not see the Hunter's ulcer. You don't see this erosion, which is very apparent and obviously would be a source of pain. But when you distend the bladder, you tend to see these grape-like structures on cystoscopy. And we use the word glomerulations, uh, which is the association uh, of, uh, of uh, bladder lining pathology uh, that we think is the basis for interstitial cystitis. But truth be told, glomerulations occur in people who have absolutely no symptoms of uh, interstitial cystitis if you distend their bladder uh, with the, 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 the fluid that we put in during cystoscopy. So the non-ulcerative IC, or we now call PBS, or painful bladder syndrome, is the same sort of pain, uh, urgency, and frequency condition. But uh, when you look at urine cultures or any other testing of what could be causing it from an infectious perspective, we don't see any positive results. So uh, there are strategies uh, that engage in the concept that the lining has defects. It lets toxic substance through the lining into the next layer, which is the bladder wall. It irritates the bladder wall, causing urgency and frequency. And that has been the basis for many of the treatments. So the treatments involve uh, um, bladder distensions to, to help the, the lining, uh, medicines like Elmeron to help the lining. Uh, and Elmeron, I must say, has recently uh, been shown uh, or to be associated with uh, serious side effects of uh, visual impairment. Um, and uh, the other issues are what we install in the bladder, like DMS, DMSO, heparin, lidocaine, a bunch of other uh, substances. So. The fact of the matter is, uh, uh, as Dr. Kim said, maybe it's possible that IC, which is this nonspecific pain, urgency, frequency, absent testing consistent with infection, could really be caused by outside the bladder pathology. And there's a growing, um, I guess, appreciation for if you think you have IC, look outside the bladder for the pathology. And the bladder may actually be innocent in here, uh, uh, and I want to pick out three areas of outside the bladder regions that could cause pain, urgency, and frequency in a negative urine culture. And these would not respond to traditional Elmeron treatments or traditional uh, installation treatments and are really not reflective of pathology in the lining of the bladder called the epithelium. That's pelvic floor dysfunction. And we have uh, um, uh, April Patterson is going to talk about that. She's a professional pelvic floor physical therapist amazing uh, uh, therapist that I work with a lot, uh, especially in women who have uh, persistent arousal. And April will be very happy to tell you she had this condition of PGAD. Uh, and Dr. Kim did amazing surgery on her and she's now relieved of this condition. Nerves outside the bladder, such as the pudendal nerve or other nerves uh, may uh, be associated. And these are uh, explanations outside the bladder. And what I wanna spend is a few minutes on this condition called vestibulodynium. I don't want anyone to say, wow, that's a big word. The word dynia just means pain. And you could have pain of your chest, and we call that chestodynia. And there's a region in the genital called the vulva. You can have vulvodynia, a region in the vagina, vaginodynia. But I'm specifically talking about the pain in the region that is just to the inside uh, before you get to the vagina. It's the region just before the vagina called the vestibule. So pain in the vestibule is vestibulodynia. Specifically, you can have vestibulodynia for many reasons, but I'm gonna pick on two reasons. Uh, one that's related to low testosterone, what we call hormonally mediated, and one that's related to too many nerves 
that exist with only in this tissue called endoderm and embryology uh, that are really because mast cells get attracted to the endoderm of the vestibule and they proliferate nerves by release of various factors called nerve growth factors. Now, since, I mean, if you look at this picture, this would be the hymen here. These are the one o'clock vestibular glands, the 11 o'clock vestibular glands, and here's the urethral meatus. You can see by complete proximity to the urethra, if you had an irritated one o'clock gland or 11 o'clock gland, that may cause urgency and frequency and a pain. Now, if you look at it as schematic, this is the real live version, this is the schematic, Here's the three centimeter female urethra. Here's the urethral meatus. Here's the gland that surrounds it. If this gland was irritated and erythematous and tender, wouldn't it be logical to just think that that may irritate the urethra? That's outside the bladder. There's nothing to do with the urethra. There's no abnormal urinary uh, pathology on urinalysis or urine culture or any other testing that we do. So I wanna spend two seconds on this and say that if you treat successfully the, the, uh, the, the vestibular gland pathology by giving hormones in cases when the hormones are uh, abnormal, and here's the erythromiatus, you can see it's a real live picture of someone who had vestibulodynia but was diagnosed also with IC that was unresponsive to oral pills like Elmeron, unresponsive to the traditional bladder installations and other treatments. All we did to this woman was give her hormones, some external uh, systemic testosterone and local testosterone estrogen to the vestibule. All the redness went away. And guess what? We cured her so-called IC, which was really uh, a, a urethral irritation from the glands. This is a woman who had a different kind of vestibulodynia. Here's her one o'clock gland. Her urethra is around here. Here's her vestibule. She had a condition called neuroproliferative vestibulodynia. Again, too many mast cells, too many nerves. We removed her vestibule surgically. Here's her vagina attached to her vulva. She no longer has uh, uh, the vestibule. Here's her urethral meatus. This caused her to have a diagnosis of IC, again, unresponsive to traditional treatments. After the vestibulodynia surgery called vestibulectomy with vaginal advancement flap, this woman no longer had the symptoms of IC cured. We did nothing to the bladder. We did not do installations, not oral pills. Dr. Goldstein, we have a question about, could vestibulodynia also cause hip pain? Or I'm going to leave that, that to Dr. Well, okay. April and Barry, because uh, it's involved in the pelvic floor and the nerves. Thank you. And the last slide I have is just real world. I didn't want to say, well, based on one person or whatever. We sent 233 patients of mine who had vestibulodynia. 75 respondents, so about a third responded. Within the one third, we had actually successfully treated their vestibular pain in two thirds of cases. Now in this population, one third were fully diagnosed with IC before they saw us. These women were diagnosed and unsuccessfully managed with IC. So this is real world. This is what I see in my clinic. And I'm gonna show you this because this is the piece de resistance sort of picture. Treatment for IC, which involves the Elmeron uh, bladder distension, hydro distension, and, and other uh, strategies specific to the bladder. And I'm looking here, improvement in bladder symptoms. And you can see this is 40 to 60%, 80 to 90%, 90 to 100%. You could see that they had very little improvement in bladder symptoms with treatment specifically for IC. Yet when we treated their vestibulodynia and we did nothing to the bladder and we looked at bladder treatments as a secondary outcome of successful management of their vestibulodynia, these are all the women who now had improvement in their IC symptoms. So I'm not making this stuff up. This is what we see in our clinical practice. We do see women who have IC treated, diagnosed, but didn't really have IC, but had stuff outside the bladder I'm pointing it out, it can be pelvic floor, it can be pudendal nerve, it can be now vestibulodynia. And we're very good with vestibulodynia management. And I'm gonna call out a woman who's 21, who I just saw today in the office, who had an IC diagnosis, had been on Elmeron, had lidocaine installations, and I did a vestibular anesthesia test. I numbed her vestibule and I had her urinate. I did nothing to her bladder, I did nothing to her urethra, I just numbed the vestibular glands. And she peed today for the first time in a long time without pain. So this is real. This is not fantasy. 
And uh, what I'm going to do now is open up the discussion to April at the Public Board of Physical Therapists. And we're going to ask her a very specific question. April, can you explain how the pelvic floor relates to the possibility of this condition of bladder uh, pain, urgency, frequency, without any uh, tests that, that relate back to infection? OK, thank you. Thank you. Can I, can I uh, interrupt with a question that both of you can answer? Uh, one, um, I think it's important to point out that uh, interstitial cystitis is the name of a, you know, a set of symptoms and disorders and there is a bladder derived problem, but um, there's a group of patients whose symptoms mimic interstitial cystitis where their problem is outside the bladder. Do you have any idea what percentage of patients with IC symptoms are bladder related and non-bladder related? And two, from your experience, is there a way that a patient can kind of like assess whether it's their bladder that's causing them symptoms or their urethra? which is the tube where the urine comes out of um, at the very end. Is there a way to tell, or is it just so complicated that uh, it needs to be worked up medically? Um, those are fabulous questions. <laughs> and they're, uh, they'll probably be answered by much, much of the faculty. I'm going to say that since I'm a practice that does sexual medicine and uh, genital pain is an extremely common issue, for me, so I'm going to see I see mixed in with the genital pain, like difficulty having intercourse, entrance dyspareunia, that type of stuff. I'm going to say to you that it's much mm. more common for me to see that I see is outside the bladder than inside the bladder. Uh, I'm getting people who are failing the traditional I see treatments in general, so uh, uh, um, and, and that's not an uncommon outcome, anyways, from the I see treatment. Um. Hey guys, excuse me. Um, I my internet connection. I don't know why this is doing. This is unstable. I may lose you, and I'll come right back on. I apologize. It or I'm gonna can you also address the hip pain and um, yes, yes. You know what? I, it just I, I still see you though. In my back. Okay, you can hear me. Okay. Um, so you're. It's complex, but your hip, um, I can actually address it when I go through the pelvic floor because you actually have hip muscles in inside your pelvic, in, inside the pelvic bowl, um, as well as the pudendal nerve. Um, it innervates the vestibule. So if you have vestibulodynia, I don't see if there's an issue with the pudendal nerve that could also give you hip pain. Um, but usually the obturator internus is a hip muscle and sometimes that pudendal nerve can be affected there by that muscle in your hip. But there's definitely other, there could be other things going on um, even outside of the pelvis that could be contributing to that hip pain as well. They could be completely unrelated or they could be related. That, so it's not out of the realm of possibility. Um, but it's not out of the realm of possibility. It's and probably an uncommon presentation from an orthopedic standpoint to have just hip pain. I don't. I don't know if people who have hip pain will actually tell their physician they have vestibular pain, or if they even know what that is, or if they even know if they have pelvic pain. I mean, I had I had hip pain for years, and I had pelvic pain and low back pain. So um, I never saw a hip doctor. <laughs> so, um, and, and we'll go into it later, but when I had surgery, it fixed my hip. I had back surgery and it fixed my hip. So there's so many areas that can refer to your hip. It doesn't mean it's actually a problem with your hip joint. Do you um, want to call up your slide? I'm sorry. Talk please? about the pelvic floor. Yes. And what I was going to say is that um, first, thank you for having me on here as a professional and also for helping me as a patient. Um, and so research shows that 85% of patients with the diagnosis of IC actually have pelvic floor dysfunction. So, um, you know, with all the bladder directed therapies, they, it could be an explanation of um, also why they don't work well alone. If you're just getting a bladder directed therapy and you're not getting pelvic floor physical therapy, you're probably not going to get better. Um, so that's one thing. Um, also, as pelvic floor physical therapists, when we do a pelvic floor exam and we palpate the muscles of the pelvic floor, it often reproduces the IC symptoms for the patient. So that can be very validating. Um, 
as well as it just shows that the pain that they and their symptoms that they perceive to be happening in their bladder and urethra are actually coming from their pelvic floor muscles. So I wanted to do um, just like a quick overview of the pelvic floor and how it could be, um, how it affects the bladder and the urethra. If that's okay. Um, so here is the picture um, model of the pelvis and your bladder sits right behind your pubic bone. Um, and a lot of people have pain right here by their pubic bone. And this would be the sit bones of the pelvis that you'll feel when you're sitting down. Um, and then this would be lying down and I just want to make, see if I can make this bigger for myself because I can barely see myself on here. Okay, now, well, that's okay. All right, so here is the- That is a really one. detailed model. <laughs> Wait, is this going to be taken down on Facebook? Oh my goodness, I didn't think of that. Um, yep. So these, this is the first layer of your pelvic floor. It's your external layer, um, your superficial layer. And these are pelvic floor muscles that go around your labia majora and they form a triangle called the urethra the vagina and it extends around the anus here. So something just to note, um, there, the pudendal nerve comes out right by uh, this sit bone here and um, goes down to innervate these muscles and vestibule labia majora. And so if the pudendal nerve you know, is causing the irritation, um, the bladder symptoms, urinary symptoms. Um, if these muscles are tense here, they can actually um, contribute to that irritation or cause compression. And then I wanted to show you inside. Um, so I'm going to take the organs. Can, out. can I get you to do one thing? One yes, second. please. Can you go back to what you just did with the cell phone. Oh. Okay. So I have you... a fascination of bicycle riding and yeah. association of bicycle riding to IC and to pain. For sure, now, yeah. where you sit on the saddle of the bicycle is right on that nerve. Can you? It's can you right that? on that nerve. Um, I mean, I would suggest take finding- your, Take your pen. Could you show us where the, where the right- These right are the, ish, these are the bones. These are the ischial yeah. tuberosities here. Yeah. And yeah, so when you sit- For all of you bicyclists- Right in here. would actually sit on the sit bone, but are sitting on the saddle. Right, the it's, it's is narrow. right here, and it's yeah. right where it the nerve exits your pelvis. Exactly. Um, so, taking out the organs, we're going to look into the. Oh, that was the rectum. Um, sorry, this is um, the deepest layer of your pelvic floor. This is layer three, wow. and you can see here that it actually attaches right behind your pubic bone, which is where your bladder sits, and all the way to your coccyx. Okay, and then the sides of the pelvic bones here. Um, so its main role is to support the organs here inside, but it also works together and coordinates with the muscles of your spine, of your abdomen, of your hips. Um, they all work together. So something that's wrong here, above here, can affect your pelvic floor. Um, also, just to note, your rectum, your vagina, and your urethra all go through your pelvic floor. So if there's any dysfunction in your pelvic floor, that can cause symptoms of bladder, bowel, or sexual function. So um, in regards to urethral symptoms, um, the pelvic floor's job is also to, it has sphincteric control, so it controls the urinary sphincter. Um, and so the pelvic floor should be able to contract to maintain continence, but it also should be able to relax to release urine. And this is um, one of the things we find with IC patients is the muscles are too tense, they're overactive, they're painful, they're, they don't do a good job relaxing um, and that can cause symptoms of IC. So um, the next thing so I wanted to show- Can I a question? Yeah, sure. Is it oversimplified to think that if the muscles of the pelvic floor tend to be tight, that it's compressing the bladder or intermittently compressing the bladder, bladder making it- um, think it's so the muscles of the abdominal wall yeah, definitely yeah, have, no, these, this is great. So the muscles of the abdominal wall, um, they can affect the, the, the tension around the bladder. I mean, every organ is covered in fascia, as you know. And so if your abdominal muscles are too tense or maybe you have to have scars there. Like I had a C-section scar that gave me all kind of bladder things. Um, so that, um, that can restrict and it can 
restrict the bladder. I mean, we don't have, I don't have a way to measure that. I just, do they get better? Yes, I treat this, they get better. So, and it's moving better and I can feel it's moving better and their symptoms are reduced. So that's definitely um, something we see. So April, you um, had symptoms of yeah. IC while you had the mm -hmm. PGAP, correct? I did, yeah, yeah. Can you tell us what symptoms you had? What, yes. what were the symptoms of IC that you had? Um, I had bladder pain and urgency, mainly in sitting. Um, it was very intense at the end, like every time I sat down, but I had my other GPD symptoms probably at the same intensity as well. Um, I um, had hesitancy when I, um, I had trouble relaxing. That for me was that one area of my pelvic floor. It wasn't my entire pelvic floor, um, even though they all overlap, that one area um, of the anterior wall of the urogenital triangle, which I do want to show you a quick picture of, but we can go back to it because I just think it's a fascinating image. But um, it um, it always felt like it couldn't fully relax and it was painful. It definitely was painful to palpate around there. Um, but my symptoms were I had difficulty relaxing. So um, sometimes I'd have pain trying to relax. So have pain necessarily urination, but it was getting urination started. It hurt, it throbbed it to, to start my urine stream. Also, I'd have a feeling of incomplete emptying. Um, sometimes not a lot came out. Uh, and then when it did, I'd immediately feel like I had to go again. Um, so th but those are the, the day, main yeah. ones. Pardon me? At the end of the day, these symptoms were resolved without any right. well, treatment. So I did, I did, I did think this was a musculoskeletal problem, just what I know about the pelvic floor. I really didn't think I had a, I had lesions in my bladder. So during this time, this was years, I was um, self-treating, I was treating with other colleagues and it would always give me some relief, but the threshold just kept going up. The longer I had the symptoms, the longer the more GPD symptoms I had, the more centralized my symptoms were. I, I just, uh, by the end, I was, I was treating myself daily just to like barely function. So. Okay. So, I'm gonna um, move on just, as a background for, just for, as a background for everybody, yeah. April is one of my patients with GPD, but I had no idea about the urinary symptoms because we didn't know to ask about them back then. You know that? So yeah. all this urinary symptoms that you're talking about for yourself, I, 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 I think I sounded that. like nuts. <laughs> I had so many symptoms. It was like, I had a book on my symptoms and I was tracking them. And <laughs> so, um, yeah. You're not the only one. I think when it comes to the pelvis. Cause you're, 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 you're trying to figure yourself out. Symptoms. Yeah. The pelvis has so many important things. It's, we don't think mm -hmm. about it, but like, some really important organs lie in your pelvis. If you develop sciatic and a drop foot, your foot and ankle, that's a dumb organ. It's like this, <laughs> it's like checkers down there. Right. The it's, pelvis it's is always like always on. It's always on to so, some degree. It's one. so many that's things. Why this problem has been so challenging because yeah. at least in my clinic with fine patients, when we start talking about pelvic problems, the floodgates open and it's very confusing. Mm -hmm. I start to glass over. So that's right. why we have this big team because no one specialty can deal with this, but um, uh, exactly. it's very common to have multiple symptoms all at the same time. That's what I think makes this diagnosis so difficult. Right. Anyway. To tune them all up the same thing. Can we get Barry to talk about all the nerves in the pelvis and how they yes. may relate to the bladder? Barry, okay. what do you think? Okay. Teach us. <laughs> Everyone put their thinking caps on and your reading glasses. This is gonna be intense. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> this is hardcore neuroscience here. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay. So um, this is a, uh, a schematic diagram of the uh, organs of the pelvic floor that April was just talking about and the nerves that carry sensation uh, from them. Uh, so the, uh, the pudendal nerve is uh, uh, carries sensations from the clitoris and the urethra and the anus. And the pelvic nerve carries sensations from the vagina and the urethra and the bladder and also the rectum. Uh, now, 
the uh, what what uh, April was talking about was muscle contractions in this region, uh, and they uh, can, can contribute to the symptoms. And that one of the reasons is that there's actual irritation, and the, and uh, as uh, Dr. Goldstein was talking about, was uh, uh, bicycle riding that can actually uh, mechanically irritate these nerves. Uh, it's sort of like uh, if you hit your elbow, uh, the funny bone, and you feel stars and tingling in your in your hand and, and uh, elsewhere. Um, the you, you can actually stimulate nerves not at the endings but along their path. So that's that's one of the uh, one of the ways in which the uh, muscle tension in the pelvic floor can uh, produce feelings of stim of irritation of any of these organs. Uh, now. These, these two nerves, the pelvic and pudendal, uh, uh, they actually merge at just where they uh, enter the, the sacrum, the, uh, the, the pelvic bone. And uh, so where they, where they enter on the way to the spinal cord is here. So here is, um, and they, they uh, enter at what's called uh, the uh, sacral two, three, two, two, three, and four levels of the, of the pelvic bone, of the sacrum. So here, uh, these, these nerve fibers uh, enter, and then they pass up toward the spinal cord. The spinal cord actually starts here. These are, these are the nerve roots, uh, and they're actually they're combined. The pelvic and pudendal nerve uh, combine in roots, and they enter this uh, so-called corda equina. It looks like a horse's tail. It's Latin for horse's tail because it's all the nerve pathways coming from the pelvic floor, the, 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 uh, these, these nerves, and uh, they pass up in the, in the uh, uh, corda equina, uh, and they first end up in the, the, the synapse. Their first synapse is in the spinal cord proper. It's surprising that the spinal cord actually ends just below the... I mean, it just the, the spinal cord ends just below the last ribs. So this is where the spinal cord itself is, this brown area. Uh, also, one of the things that uh, Dr. Kim mentioned is that um, uh, the, the, uh, there can also be associated uh, leg pain. Well, one of the, one of the uh, uh, participants said it can also be associated leg pain because the leg, the leg, um, the leg, uh, come, leg nerves, the sciatic nerve enters at also at S2 and S3 so uh, what happens, one of the things that can happen is that not only do muscles, a muscle contraction uh, or a bicycle riding irritate the nerves uh, in, the, in the pelvic floor itself, but if there happens to be a, a bulging intervertebral disc or a, an annular tear or herniated disc, uh, those discs can actually press directly on the nerve fibers uh, that uh, coming from the pelvic floor and also coming from the leg. So you, get, you can get a combination of all kinds of problems of, of pain and, uh, uh, and abnormal sensations coming from the, the whole, all the pelvic organs, the bladder and, and the vagina and the anus, rectum, all these, all these structures, the clitoris, uh, by having a, 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 a herniated or bulging intervertebral disc pressing on the nerve fibers as they're in the corda equina. And uh, Dr. Kim will talk about the surgery, the, the minimally invasive so-called less surgery that he does to uh, relieve the pressure on the corda equina at, at, this, at this point or around this region where the, where the discs are bulging and impinging on the uh, corda equina fibers. Now, finally, in the spinal cord itself, uh, that's where the uh, that's where the nerves have the first terminal. It's called the first synapse. So the nerve fiber coming from the vagina or the uh, the vestibule or the bladder, uh, the, the pudendal, probably pudendal nerve in the case of the vestibule, but we're not sure. Uh, and, and the pelvic nerve coming from the bladder that is that is sure. The first synapse is in the spinal cord at the level of uh, S two uh, to four. And what can happen normally? What happens is that there's uh, the nerve pathway, a, a secondary, second order neuron in the spinal cord projects up to the brain and you perceive uh, vestibular stimulation when there's vestibular stimulation. That's how we, we, uh, we, we perceive 
uh, this pathway going all the way up to the sensory cortex of the brain. And similarly, they provide the, uh, when there's bladder distension, a full bladder uh, full of urine, um, the urge to urinate, that is uh, c conveyed by the pelvic nerve, the synapses on this first order, neuro second order neuron in the spinal cord and projects up to the, up, oops, sorry, up to the brain. And we feel a, a bladder uh, filling. So nor that's the normal situation in which we can certainly tell the difference between vestibular stimulation and bladder stimulation. Uh, but what happens is that in the case of, of, a, of an actual uh, pathology, like the hunters, uh, well, in this case, it's, it's the, um, uh, the, the uh, uh, vestibulodynia. Vestibulodynia, yeah. That the vestibulodynia um, uh, irritates the second order neuron. And at first, it just, uh, it just is vestibular pain. And, uh, but you see that there are normally uh, interconnection between the neurons. This is all in a very, very small area of S2, 3, and 4. It's a very small part of the spinal cord. It's the smallest part of the spinal cord. And th so there's a close connection between the, uh, the neurons uh, that carry the sensation. Normally, they, we can tell the difference. And, and even if there's initially, if there's pain in the vestibule, we can, we just feel vestibular pain. We don't see any, there's no confusion with other regions. But if it goes chronically, then this is called central sensitization. That the chronic irritation from, from one uh, second order neuron that coming say from the vestibule can irritate the neuron, the adjacent neurons that they're all in the same region. They can irritate those neurons, and then it, it feels as if there's an irritation of the bladder. It feels like that because the stimulating the nerve that normally carries sensation from the bladder. But if, if you look at the bladder, if you do a bladder examination, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the bladder. It's pain that is referred to the bladder only because the second order neurons that normally convey that sensation it's absolutely now they're activated by, by an alternative method. What, uh, I have Sadie? not seen this slide before. I think this is amazing. Wow. That's a new, I made it up for special for this. So this uh, slide for, basically <laughs> means that nerves that are nearby each other in some way or have cross connectivity proximally, mm -hmm. you know, um, higher up in the nervous system, that a signal from one branch could jump over to another branch and trick us into thinking a different problem basically is what you're precisely saying, right? and that's that's the mechanism the neural mechanism of referred sensation and that's very very trouble trouble troublesome because um oh here's here's another this is the same idea so i'm not going to go through the whole thing but it's just the same idea except where the the uh, bladder uh, a bladder problem can be referred to uh, another part of the, uh, uh, an actual bladder problem can be referred to uh, the clitoris, for example. So you could have a referred clitoral pain uh, in response to uh, uh, an actual problem with the bladder. So, um, and, and it's really, uh, this, is, this can uh, create uh, significant problems because uh, there are cases of, of actually when, when the, the doctor tells the woman that uh, she, the woman complains of clitoral pain and uh, in, in a condition called PGAD, persistent genital arousal disorder, which we're also calling uh, uh, dysesthesia, uh, pelvic dysesthesia, um, then the, uh, uh, the, the woman complains of clitoral pain. The uh, examination of the clitoris says there's absolutely nothing wrong with your clitoris. Uh, maybe you just uh, upset, maybe you're just imagining it. It's actual, it's actual, um, uh, it's an actual sensation of clitoral stimulation. And even in some drastic cases, when, when the women uh, could not get any, uh, any uh, satisfaction uh, of, of clitoral uh, uh, treatment, uh, the clitoris was removed surgically. And then she had pain in her, it, then she had pain in her phantom clitoris. She still felt the clitoral pain, but there was no clitoris there. So uh, this is a, an extreme, that's an extreme example of a preferred sensation of, of, from uh, of one area, actual problem to uh, a, 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 an other 
uh, perceived area. It's a, it's a neuropathology. Uh, Harry, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, the, the, the concept of distinguishing whether you have true clitoral pain or referred clitoral pain could be done by what's called an anesthesia test, exactly. where you actually block the clitoris with an, a local anesthetic. If the pain persists, then it's clearly not the clitoris. So the pain goes away, and it could be the clitoris, and we could help that situation. Right. So if you anesthetize, if the, if the problem is coming from the vestibule, and you inject local anesthetic into the vestibule, and the pain goes away, then, then that is, that, that's evidence that the problem is really in, in the vestibule. Uh, Barry, let, me get to, let me get to Chol Kim, sure. uh, who's going to take the information from all of us, from April, me, and you, and synthesize it to, to where the spine could be really the prominent uh, problem. Joel, if you are on. Okay. So, um, bear with me here. Let me activate my screen. Oops. Did I lose you guys? No, no you're still there. I, I see you. Okay. Can you guys see my slide? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So what I want to talk about is um, kind of what my role in all this is. And I want to start out by just kind of reemphasizing that uh, this field of sexual dysfunction, pelvic dysesthesias, urinary dysfunction, all the things that are occurring in the pelvis has multiple causes, not just one. And it could be vascular, it could be hormonal, it could be anatomic, it could be psychosocial, it could be inflammatory, infectious, it could be a lot of things, but it could also be neurologic. And um, we're emphasizing the neuro neurologic, but I just want to remind everybody that uh, we're talking about neurologic because it's a seminar that I put on and I'm a neuro, uh, I operate on nerves. Um, and this is something that's somewhat new, at least to the field of spine surgery. And I think it's somewhat new to the field of urology and OBGYN, where we're starting to assign uh, causes of certain pelvic disorders to a neurological problem. And if it's a neurological problem, one of the first places that we look at is in the spine because the spine has lots of opportunities to have problems uh, for which it causes symptoms. Uh, the brain too, and same thing with the peripheral nervous system, but the spine is just susceptible to all these things. So how do we go about dealing with this whole problem when I'm faced with the following scenario? Here's a patient with genital pelvic dysesthesias, and let's say they have urinary dysfunction, and they have tried everything to get it better, and finally they've seen somebody like Dr. Goldstein, who's done a very comprehensive evaluation to look at all those different problems, and have concluded, I don't think it's any of these things, and for one reason or another, I think it's neurologic, and I think it may be coming from the spine, because there's a whole set of workup um, that's very intense and comprehensive, um, that Dr. Goldstein does, including neurogenital testing, but through a whole comprehensive series of exams, he whittles it down to a group of patients that he says, I think it's a, it's a spinal problem. That's when I come in. So in many ways, I have the easiest job in the world. I just wait for people to funnel these large group of very complex patients down to a very simple question. Does this person have these symptoms due to a spinal condition? And more importantly, can it be treated reasonably? So the first question is, um, okay, we think it's coming from the spine. Is it surgically treatable? And is surgery reasonable? Because if surgery is unbelievably dangerous, then it's not reasonable, it's that simple. So what is not treatable? I'll give you an example. And there was a patient that asked the question, I'm 75, um, am I a candidate? Well, it's not about the age, it's about the status of your spine. And unfortunately, when you're 75, most people's spines, the discs, the shock absorbing discs, which are the main culprits of irritation of the nerves, they start to wear out like the treads on a tire and most 75 year olds have terrible looking spines. Not everyone, but most people do. And if you have a spine that looks like this where every single level is degenerated, there's stenosis at multiple levels, there's scoliosis, deformity, and the surgery to fix this problem is like a two day operation, which we do all the time, by the way, for problems related to very intense spinal problems. But for 
general pelvic dysesthesias, that surgery would probably cause more harm than good. So I would say that um, people that have extensive spinal abnormalities probably aren't a good candidate to evaluate for spinal treatments. There's also a group of patients where their spine looks totally normal on imaging study. That doesn't necessarily mean the spine is normal. That just means that to the best of our abilities, which is not perfect, with all the modalities and imaging studies that we have at our disposal, MRI being the most sensitive that we have to date, I'm sure there's gonna be better ones in the future, but if it looks normal, in other words, there's nothing that I can surgically treat, it doesn't matter if we think it's in the spine, I can't very well do a surgical treatment for it because I wouldn't know where to operate. So I would say that there's a group of patients uh, who fall into this category whom we can't treat just because I don't know what to treat. The best things that we treat and the ones that we have the most experience on are things like this, a herniated disc. And you can see it's like, it's obvious. It's like a pebble in your shoe pinching the nerves that's going by because all the nerves live right here. These little dots are like a baloney slice of the nerves going down the spine. You could tell they would be irritating. The other thing that will irritate nerves are these things called Tarloff cysts. A lot of people have these uh, and very similar to inter interstitial cystitis and that one finding where you distend the bladder. There's lots of abnormalities that we see in everyday medicine in patients who are essentially asymptomatic. So think about the situation. There is a group of abnormalities that we see on imaging studies where the majority of people that have that, they don't even know they have it, they're asymptomatic. But there is a group of patients in there buried inside that larger group where these seemingly benign abnormalities cause big symptoms. And it's our job to figure out which of the patients with these seemingly benign looking abnormalities like Tarloff cysts and annular tears, which I'll get to, which patients aren't affected by it and which small group of patients are affected by it. And this is the other group of patients that we have treated really well with really high level of success are these things called annular tears. So both Tarloff cysts and annular tears, if any of the people that have, are, any of the attendees have uh, seen spine surgeons that have these abnormalities, I'm certain that their spine surgeon said something to the effect of, oh, those, I see those all the time, they never cause problems. I used to say that too, but that never is a word that should never be used in medicine. <laughs> so never say never. Because if out of 100 patients, one patient does have an annular tear that's causing big symptoms, you can't tell that patient they're crazy. We just have to find that patient. And here's how we do it. It's really, really simple in its thought process. Here's an example of a real annular tear. Many people have this without even knowing it, without symptoms. But there's a group of patients that have symptoms. So how do you figure out which patients have these minor abnormalities and have symptoms. What we do is we do a targeted anesthetic injection or a steroid injection to temporarily decrease the abnormal signals that that problem may be producing. And if you temporarily get better with a targeted injection, then that gives us information that, yes, I think that dinky little annular tear that shouldn't be causing anything is contributing significantly to your symptom. If all of a sudden your symptom gets better. And this is how we do it. We order the injection. It's basically a targeted epidural steroid injection, for example. Tarloff's just, we do caudal epidurals, for example, but there's ways to do it. And if you do that injection and you ask the patient, monitor your symptoms before the injection and then immediately afterwards and tell me how much better you got. If they say they're 50% better or more, we consider that a positive diagnostic response. We conclude that yes, since everything else is ruled out due to and about a comprehensive evaluation like the one that Dr. Goldstein would do. We see a, a treatable abnormality and we've done a targeted diagnostic injection to confirm that if we block the pain signal from that abnormality, the patient will get better temporarily. That tells me that is a good patient to do surgery on as long as we can do a surgery in a very minimally invasive way. And I don't wanna go on and on about the surgery itself. I, this is more about you know, how to make diagnoses and how to treat these patients. Suffice it to say that if you're that patient that goes through that whole process and gets down to this point, there's very good solutions for it that five years ago, I would say, I have no idea what you're talking about. And there'd be a group of patients that would just continue to suffer. But 
Um, this is one of the reasons why I, as a spine surgeon, is so excited about the field of medicine that traditionally I'm not part of because I see so many patients with this problem and I just assume it's not related to the spine. And now I'm all of a sudden suddenly discovered there is a group of patients. So our job is to find that patient and at the same time, you know, get the characteristics of those patients and how well they do with treatment so that we can share this information with other spine surgeons um, and we can start getting better at taking care of this group of patients that, uh, you know, in my mind, we've basically not been able to take care of because we didn't understand the problem. Dr. So with Kim, that, I, want, I don't want to go through all our, you know, experience, but it's been five years now. We're very careful, but, uh, you know, we've reviewed probably almost a thousand patients now and we've operated on, what's the latest number? 65, Seven? 65. 65 patients in five years. And um, you know, I don't want to go through all the results because it's very specific to diagnoses, but the patients that we identify and operate on, they're roughly about 70 to 80% success rate, which is huge because before that, they tried multiple treatments without any success. So that is, uh, it's been a, an eye-opening experience. And if it wasn't for people like uh, Dr. Goldstein and Dr. Komizarak and patients uh, and, uh, and providers like April giving me all this feedback information, um, I'd probably be really ignorant and oblivious to this kind of set of problems too. But um, I think it's important that we address this problem. Joel, Joel well. can you hear me? Can I say something quick? Yes. Um, okay, go, uh, on that slide, can you just uh, the same, the, just point out that not only and hyper and hypo, that not only can uh, these uh, uh, herniated discs produce irritation, but they can also produce numbness. Right, so our, our pelvic dysesthesia patients fall into two categories. They're either patients that have hypersensitivity disorders and patients that are hyposensitivity. So hypersensitivity would be things like PGAD, clitoridinia, uh, uh, urinary dysfunction, urinary irritability, um, vulvodynia, things, things in that category. Hypo function would be um, anorgasmia, uh, lack of sensation, uh, lack of appreciation. So we've operated on both groups of patients. Most of them have had disc problems. A few have had Karloff cyst problems. Um, the hypersensitivity patients as a surgical group is much bigger and we have much better experience. Um, they do much better than our smaller group of patients that have hyposensitivity, but We've been pretty successful with our hyposensitivity patients as well, but. And the hyposensitivity is prob probably uh, uh, caused by chronic damage to the nerves and they become, uh, they lose function. Maybe. So, that, so let, right. me, let, me, uh, let me take over as moderator. I, I, let's review. We, we've talked about the title being, this is uh, IC that isn't getting better uh, with traditional uh, urologic based focused bladder treatments. And we've found that uh, uh, there's a plethora of outside the bladder issues. And getting back to Dr. Kim's experience, where he's a spine surgeon working mostly with people with leg issues or back issues, he's broadened it to engage in sexual issues. But next to the sexual organs are the bladder organs, where there's urgency, frequency, pain, and other issues. And what we're finding is that uh, there's another group of patients out there who have uh, bladder issues who could be solved by logical and rational management of uh, IC-like symptoms, but they're really outside the bladder. And to put this all together, uh, we have an actual, not just provider, but provider slash patient, uh, April, who uh, uh, we've talked about this briefly before, but maybe we can expand upon it now. Mm -hmm. uh, you had an annular tear um, um, and you were operated on, and among other things, your IC sort of symptoms got a lot better. And I, I guess that the focus that we're trying to get here is that women and uh, who have this IC-like syndrome can have conditions outside the bladder and can be helped. So uh, why don't you tell us about your experience with both really the combination of pelvic floor physical therapy and the spine surgery? Okay, um, so I had an L4-5 annular tear, and do you want to know what I did with rehab, or? Um, well, what were your symptoms first? You have the two, IC minutes, symptoms. two minutes. So I, I, I had the IC symptoms, 
And then now I don't have any symptoms. Um, I don't have any bladder pain, urgency, pain with sitting. Um, I even have some really cool bonus sexual function things that happen later um, that I wasn't expecting and improvements. Um, one of the things that I kind of find interesting reflecting on it, and I don't know if, I don't think this is a classic IC symptom, but I also don't know, it's just not talked about, or maybe people that also have PGAT as well as um, urinary symptoms have this. I've never talked about this with anyone before, but when I would have arousal, not necessarily PGAD flare, but just aroused, I would, my bladder pain would, not every time, but and it, this, it, this arousal wasn't with like direct, you know, genital stimulation, just like if I'm kissing my boyfriend on the couch, I would have to pee. I'd feel like I have to pee. I would have terrible bladder pain. I would go to the restroom. The arousal was super strong. The bladder pain and urgency was super strong. And I could not, could not for the life of me, I'd like cry in the bathroom. I could not urinate with the arousal at the same time. It almost felt like I had to have an orgasm in order to get my pelvic floor muscles to relax, to release urine. And Barry, help us. So what is going on here? Is, is that your picture where the, the bladder speaks to the... To, uh, <laughs> The arousal speaks to the bladder, speaks to the clitoris. I like it just, I was yeah, it's, it's all one big happy family in the spinal cord. Right. And the um, fact of the matter is, uh, it, the, the prime pathology was in the spine uh, right. at the end of the day, uh, right. and your pelvic floor is a bit. Correct. So um, also, I don't have that sensitivity anymore at my urogenital triangle. And as far as orgasms go, I have this... Um, I'm able to have G-spot orgasms now that I never had before. It's just like a, everything's so relaxed there now and it doesn't hurt that it's great. So I wasn't expecting that and that happened too, probably like a year later. Dr. Kim, you have done amazing stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I am just like the mercenary. <laughs> I just do what I'm told. It's all Dr. Goldstein and Dr. Komisarak. <laughs> guiding me so um one of, one of the things too just like easy job. to mention is you know when you have spinal surgery you get sent for physical therapy after um but i think that you know we don't when, when something like this and your pelvic floor is always involved when it comes to your spine and so why i mean everyone should have physical therapy especially after spinal surgery it's completely reasonable we have to we have to re, the body has to learn how to use these muscles the right way. They have to learn how to lengthen again. Yes, the nerves control the muscles, but the muscles also give feedback to the nervous system, like Barry was saying. And then that also tells the brain what to do. And, and all of this can help with that central sensitization and that crosstalk and just get you better faster. So, Let me ask the group here. We're at the four o'clock mark. If we could, well, whatever, five o'clock mark. If there's any opportunity for staying on a few extra minutes, there's a ton of questions. Would everybody agree to stay on for a few yes, minutes? Yes, I, I answered one of them about hope. Um, she has, which is interesting, actually, someone brought this up at Ishwish, but they talked about pudendal um, nerve being affected. They didn't mention PGAD, but uh, she had a total hysterectomy, she said, and she had PGAD symptoms ever since. And I'm wondering if they use the sacrospinous ligament which is right where the pudendal nerve is. Well, so, actually, uh, bringing about this patient who I know quite well and love, actually, she's a fabulous mm -hmm. person. She has uh, annular tear, and okay. uh, we did the testing, and uh, uh, so there, there, there. She there has multiple hybrid okay. versions of all of it. Got it. Okay. So uh, uh, a hysterectomy would cause scarring in the pelvic. For sure. I mean, I see some stuff. Yeah. I see I see some nerve um, the people that can't don't have the same sensation inside and um, PT can definitely help with that. Um, I see a lot of people saying that PT can do harm and I think you really have to find the right PT that's a good fit for you. We all have just like doctors we all have different expertise we all have you know maybe different tools that we use and some PTs are fresh out of school some PTs don't specialize working with pelvic pain um, kind of have to find your right fit. And just to put it out there, I'm happy to 
help you try to find a PT. Um, That'd be wonderful. Yeah. You know, I'm remembering, uh, Joel, you may remember, this is during the COVID crisis. We had a woman fly in from DC who uh, had uh, an annular tear and you did the surgery. But before we did the surgery, we did the uh, uh, injection, the, as you say, the targeted injection. And one of the observations she had during the targeted injection was that all her bladder symptoms of urgency and frequency and pain went away just for those four hours uh, related to the annular tear. Again, uh, the link between uh, the IC sort of like symptoms outside the bladder, outside of the urologic uh, sort of thinking. So we've got a few questions and no, please don't. Okay. We've, got, we've got a few questions um, and we don't have time to answer all of them. And a lot of the questions are very specific. And so we'll try to have the, the, our panelists provide answers as well as they can, but I, we've pulled out a few that are a little general. One is a really great question and you know, we've sort of answered it, but it's the, we, Dr. Karmasarik explained how all the nerves are connected, but how do you actually pinpoint which of the area, which nerves are the ones that are causing the PGAD? Well, so that, that's a really good question. And uh, I think uh, as you were saying, uh, Dr. Goldstein, the uh, local anesthetic is uh, probably one of the best ways of uh, seeing what the, what the uh, actual source is. You give uh, injection in the vestibule or, or uh, uh, infusion into the bladder. Um, and see if the symptoms are alleviated. If they're not, then you go, then you say it's probably uh, uh, somewhere else in the uh, pelvic floor or uh, farther upstream. It's a, it's really, uh, it's a, a basic, it's not easy to do that. It's, it's, a, a, it's a major uh, endeavor to identify what the actual source is. But it's really detective work. It, it, it's detective uh, work, exactly, yeah. Okay, what's another question? Uh, we've got several people very happy, Dr. Kim, that you talked about Tarloff cyst surgery. Uh, what, somebody's asking us if the surgery is risky. She's heard that many people get worse after that surgery. Is that true? Um, well, yes and no. Uh, every surgery has risks and every surgery has a performance profile where there's a group of patients that get worse after surgery. And so the success or you know, how you measure how successful the surgery is, in part, what percentage of patients get worse? I would say that depending on which study you look at and which Tarlov cyst you're operating on, there's a group of Tarlov cyst patients that are really advanced with huge Tarlov cysts that are having Tarlov cyst surgery because they already have urinary dysfunction, starting to have urinary dysfunction. And we as spine surgeons have decided, okay, now the Tarlov cyst is symptomatic, whereas before it wasn't. Now it's worthwhile taking out. Well, when you do surgery under those conditions, you're set up, you're predisposed to have bad results. So in that group of patients, you're going to have a fairly high percentage of bad outcomes. I would say close to 20%. That's a huge number of patients getting worse after surgery. So um, that's why on the one hand, no one wants to do that surgery. And on the other hand, sometimes you just have to because patients are starting to lose their urinary function. But if you do the surgery much early on and you do a smaller surgery, it's very likely that the complication rate where you get worse, it's much more like on the order of one to 2%. Now all of a sudden that surgery is reasonable. So my long winded answer to your question is in the end, you have to decide on a case by case basis because yes, there's some conditions where the Tarlov cyst surgery will be so challenging that you have a very high risk of getting worse. And some Tarlov cyst surgeries are not that challenging and the complication rate is much less. And combined with your symptoms and how bad they are and how much it's affecting your function and quality of life, we make kind of like this balancing act decision about whether or not the risks are outweighed by the benefits or the other way around. So, um, so can you, uh, can you explain in a few sentences the minimally invasive Tarlov cyst approach, the, the idea of using uh, the, 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 the sort of uh, the less approach that you do um, for Tarlow surgery. Can you explain that? Yeah, I, I would say that, um, first of all, minimal invasive surgery is not like one surgery. It is a set of concepts that drive how surgery is performed to make it less invasive. And when it comes to Tarlow cyst surgery, um, the main difference is that I use computer navigation to precisely localize where everything is 
so that I make a, an incision that is perfectly centered. And then I use all kinds of special equipment that allows me to work through a small little corridor. And basically it's an operating microscope with a variety of gain-edited instruments and 3D navigation. Um, I also try to minimize the use of you know, implants um, and plates and um, meshes and things like that because at least in patients with GPD, we want to minimize any kind of inflammatory system. So you know, the minimal invasive strategy to Tarlov cysts in my mind has to do with you know, kind of conglomeration of a variety of MIS concepts. It's not like a specific surgery like April had. Like April had a disc surgery and she had a very specific type of disc surgery that is really minimal invasive called less. That is like a specific minimal invasive surgery. My Tarlov cyst surgery is not that specific. It's just more incorporating all the concepts that I use my other spine surgeries all rolled into one. And you have videos of this on, on your website. Yeah, so if surgery. people wanna see how the surgeries are done, whether it's a disc surgery or trial of cyst surgery, you go to uh, my YouTube channel. Um, you can see a lot of the surgeries and um, uh, whoever wants can send us an email as a follow-up asking for more information and we can kind of email you the information that you need uh, for whatever it is that we can help you with. So we'll follow, after all this is done, we'll follow up with everybody by uh, email and um, it'll be an opportunity for you guys to ask follow-up questions to the group. So I have another question. Uh, one of the women was diagnosed with IC and had polycystic ovary and has, she's had bladder surgery. And she wants to know, can all of that result in sexual problems? So instead of saying she has sexual problems, can that cause the IC? She's saying she's all of this, can that cause sexual problems? So that would be requiring an evaluation. <laughs> Uh, she would need to undergo things like vulvoscopy, things like hormone blood tests, things like nerve tests to unravel the mystery. Uh, and I think what we're learning from the faculty and from our newfound experience is the, the sort of biopsychosocial integration of the pelvis uh, from a reproductive sense, an elimination sense, uh, a sexual sense. I mean, there's a, just a lot of com commonality that we have to sort of do the detective work to think what's causing what and, and how to best manage uh, that. But uh, I see and, and uh, sexual pain issues and, and pelvic floor issues and spine issues, they seem to be so related. It's really, it's, it's exciting that we have this new information. There's a whole bunch of people who, because it's an IC urologic sort of condition, have really been stuck in the bladder world and not getting better. And it's so frustrating for them. Uh, and this type of discussion is so enlightening and it's so empowering to get out of the, the I'm a IC, I'm a bladder person, whereas all of this could be associated outside the bladder. And really we can try and help people that really haven't been receiving that help. And we have to thank people like Erwin Goldstein and Barry Komizarak that's constantly looking to help this group of patients that are struggling, whereas most physicians want to just keep helping the people that are easy to help and avoid people that are challenging to help. I just love that Dr. Goldstein and Dr. Komizarek are, uh, and April are constantly looking to help the people that are struggling to find help. So um, if it wasn't for people like you guys, uh, we'd still be doing the same old boring stuff and people like me would just be still ignorant to this condition. So and, and I'm not, totally no. out of Dr. Kim, many, many people have written into the um, chat line to thank April for sharing her story Yay. because she explains it so well and so many people can relate to her. I believe she's given a lot of people hope. She's given a lot of people understanding and all of you have really explained a lot. Most of the other questions are really quite individual and probably don't need to be answered in the group chat, but I really want to thank you all for participating and thank all the people we have. I've posted several times in April as well, how you can reach to start the process if you need an assessment, if you want to speak to, uh, if you want to become a patient of Dr. Goldstein and Dr. Kim together, I posted that. If you want to have help from April, she's posted that. So it's it's there in the chat. And we want to uh, thank everybody for participating today. Before we let go, uh, the behind Dr. Kim is an entire team from SIOSD. I just want to bring up and call out Jennifer and Lana and Josh and, and uh, Vivian and uh, Adrienne and your, your team is, is, is Ashley just, and Kelly yeah, and Ashley. Ashley, just amazing, amazing stuff. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. everyone for following. Thank you.
Thanks for having yeah, me. Great all right, so we're going to say goodbye from wherever we all are <laughs> in New Jersey and yeah. LA and San Diego. Thank you all. Bye. For this Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Jennifer and Lana.